everything else versus Bitcoin essentially gets spent and dies. I want to be able to have reactive security. And I think OpVault is to date the most straightforward, easiest to use way to do that. I will not be insulted by a clockmaker. <laughs> Overall, these kind of ways to make the network easier to both build on and interact with, I think is a really big deal. If Bitcoin existed when we started Twitter, we would not have to go down the ad model path. I mean, as simple as that. Integrating Lightning into a social network is the killer app. Hello, and welcome to the Bitcoin.Review podcast, where we explore developments and projects with the people who actually make them happen. The show is supported by Pod 2.0, Sat Streaming, and CoinKite. If you're a new listener, I'm NVK. I run CoinKite, where we've been helping people secure their Bitcoins for over a decade. We make the cold card and fun products like the Block Clock. You can find more information about it on CoinKite.com. Hello, and welcome back to the Bitcoin.Review. Uh, it's been a little while. We actually have a few a few returning guests now and, uh, and somebody new here today. I guess we're going to get right on it. Welcome back, Rindell. Hey, happy to be here. Uh, welcome back, Rob. It's good to be here. And uh, welcome, Mr. Alex B., uh, first time uh, caller. Is it a uh, first time listener? Regular listener, regular li listener. Super excited to be here. Oh, I apologize in advance. Uh, <laughs> I don't understand how anyone listens to this show. There are dozens of us. <laughs> I know, right? Like, there is only so many wives that need to sleep. So, so Alex, uh, you piqued my attention there with the Bitcoin Scripts uh, a tweet thread. And I think you sort of, like, identified something interesting. We've had, like, you know, I don't know, like, 50 proposals of things coming in the last decade and 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 quite a few of them sort of like evolved and evolved and and are not far from shippable really i mean some of them are shippable tomorrow if we wanted to uh, a lot of them kind of overlap and you know realistically speaking you know most node runners are are not qualified or capable of understanding what the fuck they are most people are just sort of taking uh, inferences from like, you know, people who are a lot more technical who can sort of like unpack some of these proposals. And uh, I think your, your coming project, Bitcoin Scripts, is something very interesting. I think we need to do a better job at uh, unpacking a lot of the, the Bitcoin Scripts that are coming. So why don't we get a little bit into it? What are Bitcoin Scripts? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll leave all the wizards on the call speak to all of the more technical details. But generally, I think you got the gist of the idea. Um, it's It's been a long uh, time where we've had different proposals. Uh, a lot of stuff sort of gets hot at, at different times and, and people forget about it because it's not ready. It's not delivered into a product in their hands. And, and so... Um, you know, we, we see a lot of nice announcements during panels at conferences and, and whatnot, but it's hard for everyone, especially at the scale that the ecosystem has gotten to, to be able to keep track and keep tabs of all of that. And, and like I've pointed out, sort of like see all of all, how all of that good stuff interacts and what it might look like in terms of how we leverage those, those primitives and, you know, those, uh, those cool things to be able to interact with Bitcoin in, in different ways. And I thought it was just time for um, for someone to just like create a bit of a flag uh, that everyone could rally behind in terms of like spelling out a, a coherent narrative. I think we need a, a bit of a new narrative, technologically speaking. Layer 2 has been uh, has had tremendous progress, but a lot of this stuff uh, isn't being discussed enough. And a lot of this stuff also is not approachable to uh, would-be developers and engineers that are, um, you know, perhaps trying to look to get into Bitcoin. And so there's a lot of progress that can be made and a lot of excitement that uh, I think I, I want to generate around uh, some of these technologies. And 
the first step was just to get the conversation going. And I think I'm, I'm extremely pleased with the, the reaction and how it was received. It really feels like, you know, all the people I've been discussing, it, it really feels like you've said, I've put sort of like a, a finger on on a large gap in the market. So I'm excited to continue to collaborate with, with other people uh, in the ecosystem to, to make that happen. Yeah, you know, I think the issue that a lot of people who are fairly uh, conservative with Bitcoin and fairly uh, towards ossification, including me, sort of came to the conclusion in the last couple of years that, you know, there is no Bitcoin scale as the current code stands, right? Like we cannot scale self-custody as is, period. Like the math doesn't add up. <laughs> so, you know, you can take two paths from here, right? Like you, you can take the free banking path, right? Where essentially you're going to have this large custodians that, that will have Bitcoin and will IOU Bitcoin on them and people will do that. And that's going to happen anyways, in my opinion. And the other path is we, we tweak the base layer with very conservative choices, uh, not towards crazy computing or crazy features. It's not the point. The point is like, what tweaks do we make to Bitcoin so that we can scale Bitcoin to a billion people holding Bitcoin, right? Because there's not enough UTXOs for everybody, period. You know, and I, you know, I'm going to address the pedantic point. Uh, somebody was mentioning how many quadrillion UTXOs we have. And what they are failing to understand is when we say there is not enough UTXOs for everybody is that, you know, UTXO quantity is not going to be distributed equally, right? So it's not a UTXO per person. We already have 18 million Bitcoin already distributed to less than 5 million people. So there is not like, you know, like the, na the, last, the last 2 million Bitcoin coming in. Is it 2 million left or 1 million in a little bit left? can't remember now the current distribution. A little less than 2. I think our current supply is 19 mil. There you go. So almost there. Say 2 mil. Uh, so we, all, we have 2 mil Bitcoin for 8 billion people. <laughs> there is not enough UTXOs, right? Uh, so we have to find a way. And to find a way, we need script wizards uh, and people who understand cryptography in some pretty crazy ways to find paths for us, right? And and to unpack that gets pretty crazy. The stuff is ultra complicated. The devs can't follow. So where do we go from here? How do we manage this, right? How, how do we get the information that is ultra complicated to people who are technical, but not as technical as needed to understand this information to then help people assess if they want it or not, right? Because nothing is without trade-offs, right? So for example, I'll start with a dog, uh, you know, BIP 300 is a nope on my node, right? Like I would not support drivetrain no matter what. I do not like that proposal. I do not like things that could create MEV. I do not like things that essentially create a soft fork every fucking time they want to add a new shit coin to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, the, to that system that they created. So, you know, but I can understand that, right? So, you know, why maybe don't we mention a few proposals that are out there that are gaining steam and then we sort of like try to to go around this in terms of messaging rindell do you, do you want to list some of the proposals that like you like you've reviewed that you understand yeah yeah i mean like some of the ones that we've talked about here and that folks might see around um noster or bitcoin twitter uh you know recently james ob put out op vault which, um, you know, I, I think compared to some of the other proposals that have come out recently um, has a really nice benefit that the value prop for kind of like the median Bitcoin user is very clear, right? When we start talking about different covenant proposals, we're trying to compare and contrast different ways of building covenants. If you're not really thinking about, you know, more advanced use cases, it's it's easy to say, like, why why do I care? Why is this for me? Op Vault is, uh, you know, multi-sig security with single sig complexity. And and, and that's like the, the tagline. So there's been some conversation around Op Vault. Some of that conversation has um, also brought up Op CTV, Check Template Verify. If folks have been following any of the discussion around ARC or Enigma or these other um, 
systems that let you kind of pay forward with committed but not actually on-chain funds. Those all use either CTV or another proposal called APO. So we have APO, CTV, OpVault. I think that those are probably the most baked proposals in that kind of group. But folks might have also heard of things like Tapleaf Update Verify or TLove, as it's known to its friends, uh, or <laughs> OptX Hash. And those are all kind of like the, the various um, covenant proposals. And then NVK just mentioned there's a pair of BIPs, 300 and 301, that together give you a thing called drive chain, which is a uh, proposal to do side chains with like a very specific um, trust model. So, you know, there's there's lots more proposals for other things, but those are the things that people are probably most likely to run into if you kind of just wander into a Twitter space these days. Maybe also check sig from stack. Mm -hmm. Yep. And along with like check sig from stack and some of the other ones, um, you might hear about opcat. Opival and optx. Yep. And like opcat was in Bitcoin and then it got turned off a few years ago. And there's been some discussion recently about whether or not it should be turned back on and what that would imply. A lot going on. I think the important part like that a lot of people need to get is its motive, right? The motive that, you know, it doesn't matter. Even if some of the project maintainers may have different motives, I think that the, the motive why a lot of these things are getting the attention that they're getting is because people are feeling the strain when the fees go up. Uh, so they want more throughput. And also we need to find a way to distribute those UTXOs to more people, which they're not too different in, in practice. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I think a lot of the covenant discussion has been really interesting because I think you've heard kind of two narratives behind some of the covenant discussion. One of them is scalability. And then the one that's... Um, that had been talked about a little bit around CTV, but um, OpVault goes straight at it, is constrained spending conditions for like security and recoverability. And it, it might be, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about this in a minute with Alex, but figuring out how to like bucket these different use cases and then compare and contrast like why you might want particular features, what you get out of it and what the different trade-offs are, I think is something that you can put together if you've read all the proposals and if you've like engaged in a lot of the discussion, but there's not really a um, drive by friendly place for the average Bitcoin enthusiast to say, you know, okay, well, why is OpVault better or worse than APO for vaulting use cases? And like, why would I care about that? You know, that? ARC showed that like it has three greens and Lightning has two greens, right? Like, that's right. Kidding. Yeah, uh, that was a it's, great it's chart. Green, I love so a competitor analysis, uh, marketing material. But like, but we need to separate, right? Like, there is the stuff that people need to build their layer two solutions, and then there is the stuff that needs to be built, right? Like, the, sorry, the, the stuff that we need to change in Bitcoin. I think those two get sort of like convoluted a lot of times. So maybe what's missing is like uh, like a, a chart that shows like you know, here are the proposals on L two that are interested that people are trying to build. And then on the other axis, it shows like here is like all the the Bitcoin changes that have been proposed. And then you sort of like connect the hang on a second here. I kind of blocked my screen and I, I just noticed you guys don't have my video. I've been explaining in my hands. But anyways, so <laughs> you make kind of like a, a SWOT analysis, right, of of like Bitcoin changes versus what people are trying to build and like where do they intersect that could be interesting because if we can find the most, um, most amount of intersection, right? Like we may find one of the best compromises and then we need to find the compromises, right? So yeah, guys, like uh, how, how do you guys feel about like what's out there? And like, do we have enough proposals? Do we have enough changes? Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of proposals. Um, it's just hard for, so what I've really found out is there's, there's, it seems to me there's there are two issues, wherein um, one is sort of access to information, uh, as as Ryan Dill, um, sort of inferred, is the ability for people to have a you know repository, for lack of a better word, uh, where all of the information about every single proposal is available. You know we have great resources like Optech that sort of provides uh, a bit of that context but otherwise um, people always have to end up referring and linking to like various mailing lists 
post. It, it's very tedious to uh, even just try uh, and browse the mailing list to uh, identify conversation around a specific proposal. Uh, so the other thing that's missing, it feels to me, is a sort of like reliable asynchronous platform for people to have those conversations because what's happening is Twitter is extremely fast paced, extremely dynamic. And sometimes people just don't have the bandwidth to deal with, you know, a, a, a thread or a conversation that's happening exactly at that time. And maybe they make a mental note, but when they have more time, they try and go back to the conversation and, it, and it's lost or whatever it is. And, and then, the other options are the mailing list. The mailing list, unfortunately, is a, it feels a little contrived, you know, in, in ways people are kind of like a lot of people are shying away from contributing to mailing lists because they don't want to sort of like create noise around a specific subject. So there's, there's, there's a gap that needs to be filled here again, where people can engage in te technical conversations about those uh, different elements without having to constantly be online and or, or constantly have to sift through, you know, dozens of other messages about different topics on the mailing list. So there's an opportunity to create something there as well. So what you're saying is we need highlighter, highlighter for Bitcoin scripts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like you're not wrong. I mean, what we've just been talking about forward looking speculative changes to Bitcoin, but I think there's also a big hole with what already exists. Right. Like, um, yeah, I'm sure Rob can attest to this, but anytime I'm doing anything with script, like the, the page that I pull up is an old Bitcoin wiki article with like all of the op codes. And that, that's like the best resource that there is. Um, and there, there's not really a good developer guide on like, you know, here's how you write Bitcoin script. Here's the best practices. Like, here's the tools that you should use. Here's the VS code mode that you use. Like a lot of that developer experience stuff is, is missing. And I think that makes it hard both to onboard new developers who would otherwise want to be building stuff on Bitcoin, but I think it also makes it hard for the forward-looking stuff to evaluate some of these different proposals um, in, in an apples-to-apples kind of way. Like I was at BitDevs the other night and somebody said, hey, I, I heard you know CTV is active on Signet. Like, how do I use CTV? And I said, well, go read the BIP. It shows you what fields need to be hashed. Like, do that and then put it on the stack. Like I'm not picking on CTV specifically, but you know, like that—that's kind of the the level of documentation and tooling that exists for a lot of this stuff. And I, it's it's hard to, you know, help developers all figure out what the best practices on you know negotiating contracts over Noster when we we don't even have like the basic plumbing for some of this stuff. Here's a contrarian view. Just, just a, what if it's kind of a feature, right? I mean, I always felt like Bitcoin kept a lot of shitcoiners, a lot of shitty devs away because it was so not approachable. It was scary to talk to people. It's so fucking complicated for you to get started, you know? So it's sort of like, it created a bit of a firewall, right? Like, is it maybe time to lift the iron curtain? Or like, is that what's happening naturally? So I think there's an important thing. Like when we think about the ecosystem of Bitcoin, we have this bucket called developers. And there's a massive difference from a cryptographic protocol wizard, right? like a Peter Will and Andrew Polstra, like Andrew Towns, like these guys who are building out like the core primitives of like how these opcodes should be optimized and what they should do. And then an application layer developer like myself, right? Like you, you there should, and what you need is for like larger community adoption is ideally you want to have people who are thinking about ways that these new tools, how could they interrupt with the existing toolkit, right? Because it's not just we're adding one op code and it's done. If we're talking about like op vault, op CTV, you start talking about, okay, how do these start interacting with each other, right? The common metrics becomes a bit of a, its own meta discussion of if you have, um, proposal one, two, and three, like how do those interact with each other, right? And I, th I just think in general, like what Alex is doing with the Bitcoin script project is just starting the conversation so people can start cross-pollinating conversation. Twitter is very ephemeral. Um, you have these like pockets of discussion. And, and, and I guess MBK, like I agree with your point that it, it's good that there's some friction that you can't just walk in and right, you can just like make the world computer, you know, TM, right? Like and you don't money want to- gone. And then money gone, right, right. Like, like you want to be sensible about it. And that's another point that you made at the start of the conversation about like, 
you there are certain things that you are willing to add into your node that make Bitcoin better money and better programmable money. But you're not looking to, say, have the entire use case of all programming tied with money. Right. So then like there is no spectrum at the moment between like like Op Vault is a really great example. It's very concise, constrained of it helps secure your money as an emergency safety net versus something that may be a little bit further down the line, like a generalized government proposal, right? And then on the far, far end of that would be like BIP 300, 301 and simplicity, right? Where you're just getting arbitrary programmability to do whatever the heck you want, right? That Like there is a spectrum here of what can be done. Yeah, but say for example, like BIP 300 is margible, you know, like we don't want it, but it's margible. Where, for example, you know, simplicity is never going to happen territory, Fair. right? There's 83, 85,000 diffs. Like, it's, it's right. like, you know, like, right. it's sorry, like, you know, it's just, it's just too far. Well, there's two axes then, right? There's like, is it yeah. Bitcoin mon- strict monetary use case versus general programmability? And then like, is the bit already written with live code or is yes. it like a whiteboard idea? Because like we we're talking about other scaling solutions too. Barack put out that ARC proposal and the original consensus was you either needed APO or CTV. And it sounds like now over the past like couple of days, you actually does not work with APO because of the number of inputs that are in the, the yeah. VTXO constructs. And, and and that's not to you know, def- like, like fault Barack for like putting an idea out there and getting people excited and interested. But the point is, is that like these things, like having some better level of understanding of how these all can interact with each other. But also like we merged SegWit before Lightning was live, right? It's not like Lightning was end to end fully implemented, ready to go. And then we turned on SegWit. So there's like somewhat of a dance between protocol ideas and then the upgrades you do and making sure they're loosely in lockstep with each other and servicing each other. And one doesn't get too far ahead of the other. I mean, Lightning was going to be absolutely useless if it wasn't for for malleability, at least malleability fix, right? Yeah. Uh, it was going to be like nearly impractical, you know. But do we fall into changing Bitcoin the wrong way? There is no right or wrong, but let's just think in terms of those those ways, just just like for sake of argument. Like, do are we changing Bitcoin the wrong way, making the wrong trade offs in order to add some of these features? Right, like, is this is this something that should be part of the conversation? Is like almost forefront of the conversation, really. Like the foundational values as to why would we ever make a change to Bitcoin, or or the change, right? The so, change for itself. example, you know, the, the, so for example, reason why I don't like three hundred. Like, I'm explaining why I don't like it and why I think it, it takes Bitcoin the wrong direction, right? But again, mm-hmm. you know, this is just my node. People do whatever they want to their nodes. So we have the technical part. Right, like in terms of you know readiness, uh, like you know compatibility and what it does, what it doesn't do, and all these things. But then we have the the more soft question, which is more like a moral, ethical sort of direction one, which is like, you know, how how do we measure like you know is this change something that changes Bitcoin to something that we as the people talking right now today like think that maybe bitcoin would go in the wrong direction right it's like how how do you express this kind of question and answer on your new project well if we're uh discussing soft fork specifically what i've what i'm aiming to do is mostly avoid uh, the soft fork con- conversation completely and uh <laughs> sort of <laughs> convenient right uh but no I'm, I'm 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 really i'm really trying to just present the op codes um in, in independently of each other and also have people try and evaluate them on their own and not necessarily pitting them because what you're seeing right now on twitter and the past couple of conversation it seems like everyone's sort of like cheerleading for their own preferred op code but there's a lot of assumptions being made uh, about like, you know, I, I'm a big fan of ARC, for example, myself, obviously, but people are already sort of like assuming that like uh, ARC is absolutely necessary. We need to make it happen regardless of like what whatever else is on the table. So there's a lot of like, I think we need to progress so like incrementally uh, and we are not we're not yet at the software conversation, although people are really hungry to, you know, because it seems like there's people are sharpening their swords as we speak. Everyone's always so eager to sort of like uh, fight whoever is uh, whoever has a different op- opinion than them. But we're we're still at the conversation stage. A lot of the things are not yet fleshed out. I know that there's a lot of interest in OPTX as well, 
you know, which as far as I know, doesn't, does not have a, a BIP. Uh, There's not even code for it, I think, like or pseudocode exactly. or anything. Exactly. But then, but then you have the other sort of like uh, position, which is, well, if we're getting into the weeds of all those other proposals, then we're going to sort of like start the, the bike shedding conversation of like never ending uh, and, and, and then just never make any progress. You know, th- that's a fair, that's a fair assumption too. I mean, it does happen, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, you know, the, at, at the end of the day, there's still a whole lot of design space that's available without even a soft work. Uh, and, and those are the kind of things that I want to highlight as well. You know, I called it the Bitcoin script project because I don't know, it came uh, to me as a bit of a, a nice sort of like branding uh, uh, term. But I'm not restricting myself uh, to to Bitcoin script in terms of like what I'm trying to present. You know, there's a lot of like interesting protocols, signature uh, schemes that that are also making a lot of progress. Uh, and what happens is you combine them with you know just standard uh, script that's already available, and you already have a lot of applications that can be built. And those are some of the things that needs to uh, that need to get highlighted a little more. Do you guys know of any effort right now trying to sort of leverage primitives we already have to try to accomplish more interesting things? I mean, the one that comes immediately to mind is just mini script because it doesn't require the fork, right? And uh, we're se- we're finally seeing that movement on signing devices for supporting it, right? Cold Card just added it for the edge release. Ledger's had it for a bit. I think the Jade's adding it imminently and just like having more signers that can do this can actually move this away from something that was live and working. But since you couldn't use this, you couldn't use a hardware wallet. No one wanted to put serious amounts of money into an air gapped computer to secure funds. Right. But now that application layer tooling with the signing devices coming on board is really opening up that design space. That's just an example. And since it didn't add any op codes, like that's just a great, like bonus ad. You know, I feel like there's a bit of a hangover too, because you know, top root, was ginormous change to Bitcoin. Like people still don't like, I think, appreciate how ginormous this was. And it was going to fix everything. <laughs> right? Like, and then like, you know, it comes out and uh not much is being done with it, right? Because it takes a long time for stuff to be built. But you know, you know, do is there any, for example, lightning implementation leveraging Taproot yet, for example? It's it's coming like LDK and I think LND are both working on taproot channels, like simple taproot channels. There's like that. That's the first pass. I mean, to your point about leveraging existing stuff, one area that I'm really interested in is I think Noster is actually super interesting for coordinating like multi-party spending protocols. So, you know, I know somebody who was working on a coin join over Noster protocol. I'm working on a coin swap over Noster protocol like having wallet software talk to other wallet software over Noster and like coordinate signatures, I think is super interesting. Joinster. Yeah, Joinster, right. Is that because it's Schnorr signatures? Specifically, you can do yes. those more interesting things? You can do Frost. It, it, it also, I, I mean, so there's that, but then also just even if you, you know, just pass opaque messages over Noster, the fact that it's something that like anybody can run, it's all outbound, so it handles nat traversal for you. Anybody can run a relay. I think for um, privacy enhancing, like collaborative signing, it's interesting because if you're a blockchain analysis firm, you can see that some of it is happening on the public relays, but you can't enumerate all of it because anybody could be running a relay. And that's like a very interesting property. So, you know, there, there's not really a place where you can't spoof it. Yeah, you can't spoof it. it democratizes the coordinator role, right? Yeah. You don't have to be a big enterprise yeah. server sitting somewhere doing this coordination. Got it. Exactly. And so um, that that's a whole new design space of like, what are interesting multi-party protocols that we can build when you have a democratized like coordinator role? You know, one, one thing that I always bring it up, because hopefully I always sort of secretly wish somebody's listening and just makes it, is, um, you know, we need a interop com, secure com between wallets so that you can have multi-seed coordination multi-vendor right so for example i wish you know that my nunchuck could talk to somebody using noster sorry, noster electrum and you have a little chat box there where you know you finalize things you double check things and you send things back and forth right we don't have comms between wallets 
right? Yeah. It's insane when you think about it. <laughs> Especially when you combine it with like PSBT, the, the data that you're ch- passing back and forth is pretty well standardized, right? As well as like, maybe if I'm, I want to add Rindell as a signer, maybe I get his XPub, right? Like, or I could also use his Noster NPub for single use, but if I want to have a, a tree of many keys, right? Like, like the, the, the data elements are pretty uniform to your point. And I, I, I'll be honest, like I started whiteboarding, like what would that possibly look like? I think it's good to democratize and you don't get ring fenced into a single wallet. It's just better for the end consumer that just like you can port your social identity in Noster, you want to be able to just port your wallet experience from one wallet to the other. And you start combining things like BIP 329, like uh, Craig Raw's like wallet import export feature. And you can just start moving stuff around really quickly and easily move your labels with you. And then you're not ring fenced into one ecosystem for the life of you using those funds. I think the main thing that a lot of devs are missing in this space because, you know, it's so sort of low hanging fruit silly is that in order for people to send and receive money, they need to talk to each other, <laughs> you know, or, or even yourself, like you want to just double check an address, right? On a, on a secondary channel, right? Or for example, you're withdrawing from the ex, from the exchange or depositing on an exchange, right? You want to be able to, to, to double check that address that the browser gave you is real, right? That kind of stuff. Like I, you know, I don't see like, for example, sign PSBTs, right? I want sign PSBTs. Like, you know, we we do the the detached signatures now for any export, but it's still not like part of the PSBT standard, right? Like, I, I don't know. Like, I feel like we have a lot of this low hanging fruit, but you know, maybe some of these proposals that are coming now just to tie in, it's like maybe they start addressing some of these issues as well because it's more like a money use uh, a solution driven kind of thinking than it is, you know, about just, you know, storing it. Yeah, I mean, this is a good point too that we're like, Initially, when Jeremy Rubin came out with like the CTV proposal, it was this generalized covenant idea and everyone was kind of like confused, turned off. It becomes a meta conversation around how to activate. But then Barack talks about here's this really cool scaling solution called Arc and it needs CTV. And then you got like this wider sense of acceptance like, oh, this is a use case I want on Bitcoin. I'm open to exploring this. Right. And it's almost yeah. like a it becomes a a meta marketing kind of thing, right? Like, as opposed to here's a tool, it's like, no, here's the house. Here's the blueprint to the house as opposed to here's the wrench. Yeah, I think I think one of the consequence, um, I think that's actually one of the consequence of um, a lot of people, a lot of teams and a lot of projects are like working in silos. And that's also something that I wanted to, you know, address with, with the project. You know, it's only been like, what, a week and a half perhaps since they've announced it. And I'll, I've already gotten in touch with people who are working on things that are, you know, different projects that have similarities, that, that have uh, used technologies uh, in, in certain ways that connect with each other. And, and the fact that those people have not been having conversations before about what it is they're doing, how they're leveraging X and Y and Z, and how they can, you know how they can collaborate together to build better products and, and make it so as to your point and VK that their product, their respective product can actually, you know, find ways to interact with each other and build a better ecosystem, a- ecosystem that way. So there's a lot of people in the trenches that are really heads down coding and building. Um, but the larger issue that I've seen and I'm trying to tackle is like, it's almost sort of like, and, and people are, some people are going to hate me for saying that, but it's almost sort of like a, a product uh, development issue where like Bitcoin does not have that coordination that, that people, that person uh, in, in a normal, you know, product company that will say, okay, you each and every individual group is working on their respective thing, but how can we actually coordinate everyone so that we get better output that way? Um, There's, there's a real lack of people doing this. But you know, Alex, I find, uh, you know, and the, the project managers hate me for it, uh, and the design groups hate me for it too, that I find that a lot of times the meat in the middle, <laughs> not the man in the middle, is the, is the attack vector, right? And, I, and I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, people who are not very technical or have not been in Bitcoin for long enough to often get bamboozled by you know either bad actors or or people with agendas that are not as ideal for bitcoin you know 
and it's a challenge, right? I mean, you know, it's, you know, people are free to do whatever they want in Bitcoin. Nobody needs permission, right? But, you know, if it isn't for them, Max is going to shit on people and shit on projects and like overall shit everywhere. You know, like there's a lot of getting away with things. There's a lot of of um, of sandbagging good things. To, you know, it's. Uh, it, it's a hard balance. I mean, a balance will find itself, but you know, it's not. It's not an easy. It's not an easy task for for non technical people, who are not very seasoned in Bitcoin, to exist in this space as a like active member. I mean, I've been following Bitcoin for almost ten years. In the moment, any conversation, like in these conversations, I'm much more of an observer role, trying to ingest information, and that's been around for you know almost a decade now, right? And it's maybe it's because I'm not a deep level cryptographer, but even if you were to pick something, right? We, we all, everyone here, agrees on BIP X or opcode Y. Then it becomes a whole meta discussion: how do you even activate it, right? So there's there, there's the initiating of turning something on and then activating afterwards. And I think that's also where a lot of stuff seizes up, where there's a lot of trauma from 2017 still. People really, really don't want to put themselves out there as being someone who's trying to change Bitcoin. And then, like you said, Rodolfo, like everyone just gets like shit on. Like you just get a massive target on your back the moment you're trying to do something. And that's where um, like that's where you get kind of like this very slow and steady approach right now. And I think Alex's project is trying to not push back on that, but at least getting people feeling permissively okay to talk about fun things that could be done in Bitcoin and opening up that design space so people can start thinking about the direction of what are the future things to bring to Bitcoin that make it better money. Yeah, I mean, like, there's definitely some room for, um, like, if, if you want to be a PM in Bitcoin, so to speak, right, and, and like, really make a difference. I, I think, um, like, the Bitcoin design community is a good example of this. Like, they've put together a lot of resources, documentation, helped other projects on, you know, making things more polished, more accessible, like easier, easier for people to either get involved or people to consume or for people to use, you know, going back to like, there's a lot of stuff that you can do with Bitcoin as it exists today. And just connecting the dots of, hey, you know, these two wallets both um, have a multi-sig coordinator built in, like, maybe we should you know, figure out a way to let them talk to each other or, um, hey, you three projects, you're all working on coordinating, signing over Noster. Like maybe we should share notes, right? Like there, there's some of that just cat herding that that I think if if somebody out there that's listening that has kind of those traditional like product or project management skills and wants to make a big impact, I think you could have a really outsized impact on, you know, w- without having to go and advocate for you know, BIP8 versus BIP9 activation, like you can just go and make a huge outsized impact just helping existing projects like work better with each other or attract new contributors. Yeah, I mean, to your point, uh, to your point in VK quickly, um, like one of the things that I wanted to avoid most when uh, discussing this project is create this appearance of a roadmap, uh, you know, because we went through that in, in 2000. Uh, 16 and 17 uh, with the core scaling roadmap for those that were there at the time that you'll remember. Um, and it, it was a bit of a, you know, it had its, it had its benefits. Um, and, but obviously it should have never come out of core. It should have never been called a roadmap. It should have just been a conversation about, uh, you know, where Bitcoin technology is at and where it might be heading in the future. Uh, but, you know, regardless of all of it, all of its faults, I think it was a very productive sort of exercise. And I mean that because at that time, people were absolutely lost in terms of like where Bitcoin should be heading. They had no comprehension at all of like how far we had came. Like I I remember creating articles at the time for, for Bitcoin Core and whatever about like the amount of work that went into Bitcoin only for it to, you know, not break even with like one megabyte blocks. And so I, I feel like there's a, a need to sort of like perhaps go through that exercise or like benefits to go through that exercise again, where uh, you have people uh, sort of like warm up to all of the good stuff that's been worked on in the last couple of years uh, so that we have sort of like a, a more common uh, appreciation for 
uh, where the tech might might be going. So you don't want to create because yeah, you don't want to create this sort of like centralized vector in terms of a product manager that defines a roadmap or where the product uh, is to be going. But uh, like I think Reindel put it best. It's like it's what I've been trying to do is literally herding cats, getting people to talk with each other, see how there might be connectivity between uh, between their project. And it's already been like it's already been hugely beneficial. Like there's some people that have been getting in touch with and having conversation with other people, and you know it feels like we're already kind of like building momentum. And I'm really hoping to to continue doing this. Yeah, I mean it, it, the project is a very tricky project to steward right because y- you don't want leaders like realistically right like you know like i know like people like to say that you know you need leadership here you need this that no you don't like you know it's so like so how then do you make it happen right <laughs> and and it's hard for a lot of people to sort of like wrap their head around the spontaneous order and sort of voluntary volunteership and meritocracies and you know, it's very, very, very hard for people that haven't worked in large uh, open source projects, especially, I mean, nothing really is like Bitcoin, like no other open source projects like Bitcoin either. Like you just have this thing, it's like a big soup and somehow like glory comes out of it, <laughs> you know, but like, but it's just a fucking soup. Like, you know, nobody wants to lift their hand. Nobody like, you know, nobody wants to tell anybody, but somehow it still happens. Right. Because the right people always find the right people to sort of like steward things. So I, I, I really think that like, if we can improve like this thing, continue being a soup, and not become sort of like a salad or something else, <laughs> uh, you know, I think we're winning. You know, soup is a really funny metaphor because rough consensus is fluid, right? Like yeah. it's not like this firm structure like thing. And, 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 Rindell is just shaking his head right now. <laughs> his beautiful blue eyes just shaking right now. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, that, that's true though. Like the moment you bring some organizational structure, like I could, there are problems with that, right? So it is fluid. There, there is no, and it's the only way it has to work because it's how the network persists after the fork happens, right? You can't maintain. No, I think we've like, been lucky. No, I, I think it really is because we've been lucky, right? We had people who were maintainers who understood deeply that not taking a side, not having an opinion where it was important to not have an opinion, sort of like, kept Bitcoin like this decentralized really like we were just lucky that we had the right people at the right time mm-hmm. <laughs> you know like it's a total moonshot here so okay we're gonna have like a bunch of a bunch of like interesting script changes that people are gonna propose uh, hopefully we can find some room to to do cool things with things we already have and we have all these cool proposals that need, that require changes, and hopefully they can find ways to do things without changes, right? We have a we have a a, a three D chart here, Alex. Uh, what's uh, what's what's your like sort of like activation plan here? How how are you gonna get your idea out, and and what what do you intend to build? Yeah, sure. Um, well, the next step is continue what I've been doing, which is getting in touch with with people, having conversations. I'll be, uh, I'm flying out to uh, Nashville tomorrow for Bitcoin Parts Conference, uh, and I'll see Rob there, I think, and, and a lot of other people. So I want to get in their head and, and see where they think, uh, you know, the project should, should be going. I've been very insistent from sort of like day one when I made the announcement that this is not going to be one guy's project. And so I want to have, like, you, you want to get... The opinion of enough people who, who are working on Bitcoin on their own specific project, but you rarely get their opinion, you know, about the ecosystem as a whole, unless you know you have those private conversations with them. And so, uh, this is the first part of uh, what I'm trying to do. I have a long list, like a laundry list of people that I want to get in touch with, just over a call or and whatnot. You know, remember that Kanzuri did that back in 2017, got in, uh, got on the phone with a bunch of like Bitcoin core developers and just, uh, you know, not, not anything that was made public or whatever, but uh, actually probably typed down a lot of their thoughts and, and formatted that in, in a way that like whatever they would agree to, to be made public would be made public. And I think there's a huge benefit to that. 
but I will also just want to use it to, to guide whatever it is I'm doing. And, and the next stage will be to actually, you know, start writing and start building. Um, I've already got in, in, in touch with a, a guy that's, uh, that messaged me when I announced the project who's building a very, very cool Bitcoin script sort of like education platform. This one is more like bare metal, uh, literally uh, it is very technical with the project. I want to try to address every level, but what he's doing is uh, I think will be very helpful for people to look at Bitcoin script and get initiated with it rather than having to consult like a Wikipedia page, like Reindel said, like he has a very neat visualization tool that where you can see all of the stack operation happening. So I think that would be fantastic to sort of like drive the project uh, forward. I've, I've, I've had conversations with him about potentially, you know, joining forces and, and for me to take care of a lot of the content where he's uh, doing a lot of the uh, more technical stuff. So we'll see where that might be headed. But um, yeah, first, first is just discuss with more people and, and create those interactions and, and get people excited. I, I don't, I don't want to take, um, you know, I don't want to say that it's only because of me that it's been happening. I think uh, ARC as a whole sort of like lit a fire under everyone's ass. But if you look at Twitter in the last couple of weeks, you, you're seeing people that uh, were kind of like not engaging for a long time that you'd rarely hear about on, on social media for, for the right reason. You don't want those people to be on social media at all, almost. Uh, but, you know, you have Rusty and, and, and Christian Decker uh, actually pitching in. And also I'm seeing like a lot of like new ish developer people that have sort of like been working in the industry for a long time, but were never, it, I, I think never really felt comfortable to, to speak up about specific issues because they felt like there was a pecking order. But now I think they've, they've sort of matured into um, a, a very confident contributors that are actually, you know, putting forward very, very intelligent contributions and, and, and suggestion. Uh, so I'm excited to just get people talking, uh, and we'll see where that leads. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, Twitter sort of started to become useful again. It seems like a lot of people who 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 don't LARP actually make the stuff or participating in the conversation for a change, which is kind of nice. Which used to be the case way back. You know, I love like there is one guy that I love. Like he's essentially like uh, one of my uh, oracles of like uh, how like this one sort of side feels about things is that floppy disk guy. Yeah. Great smart guy, uh, very very independent thinker. There's there's a few guys like that. So like you know it is improving. The the, the discourse is improving. I think also when it comes to a lot of this more technical stuff, like a lot of people just can't have an opinion. So so like they they don't interrupt the conversation in a bad way that helps rindell and rob like you know as two industry people who who end up using a lot of the stuff and sort of giving feedback sometimes to the people building these proposals like you know is this is this useful like what do you guys feel like you need in order to improve uh the the, the feedback loop right because between industry and and bitcoin core development yeah, I, I mentioned it a little bit before. I think, um, you know, I work with a lot of people who are seasoned developers, like they've been building stuff, server side, mobile, front end, you know, firmware and hardware, like just up and down the stack. And when they want to start helping with like Bitcoin applications, there's all the complexity that's just inherent domain complexity in Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin is incredibly complex. Even if you're just talking about layer one, uh, lightning is like an order of magnitude more complexity once you like start working on lightning. Even once you get past just really understanding how Bitcoin works and why Bitcoin works, if you want to start, you know, programmatically constructing transactions and and it has any kind of custom scripting involved, like again, your your resources are like the uh, the Bitcoin wiki and Barack ScriptWiz tool. And I think Rob's been using the um, like scratch based, um, you know, tool on the BDK website for uh, uh, Miniscript. And that's kind of it. Like maybe you find your way to uh, BTC Deb, right? Which is like a debugger for script, but that's kind of it, right? And, and if you look at other tools and technologies that people are used to developing with, there's like a developer guide that has narrative on like, 
here's what you're going to be doing. Here's how you're doing it. Like, here's the tools that you should use. Here's the way that you should think about it. Here's how you test it. So I think a fair amount of, you know, the, what would really help a lot would be just like documentation, maybe a little bit of tooling. I think that that stuff would all be really great. Um, to what we, you know, to the conversation earlier about having an opinion, like I didn't really wrap my head around Taproot until I was actually contributing some code to Ord, like the Ordinals wallet. Cause like the Ordinals wallet has to put together very funny shaped Taproot transactions, like from scratch. And when I was like working on some of that inscription code, it really helped click for me, like how Taproot actually works. Like you can read you know, uh, BIP, uh, uh, what is it, 341, uh, about like how the control block gets validated as many times as you want. But I feel like until you actually build one, it, it doesn't actually click for you. And I think it's it's hard if you're looking forward to really evaluate, you know, why is some shape for op vault better or worse from, for composability, unless you've actually tried to compose op codes together. And it's um, hard to understand like, what things are easy or difficult in Bitcoin script today, unless you actually do it. And so, um, you know, having better docs and tooling around this stuff, I think would really help. Yeah, but I, you know, but are these things sort of like the same thing or kind of like, seems like different projects, right? Like one thing is Bitcoin just needs better docs. <laughs> well, I mean, what I'm hoping, you know, so Alex was talking about, he wants to bring together people who are doing different things around like the Bitcoin script ecosystem. Some of that is just going to be, yeah, here's the reference docs on the opcodes. And we already have Bitcoin Wiki, we have Optech, like those are good um, reference resources. I think a thing that's missing is that there's a bunch of these common patterns that a lot of people are doing throughout the ecosystem. And it'd be good to get all of them, you know, together and say, hey, what are the things that we're doing? And how do we make it easier for people to do these things? Yeah, I, I agree with Rondell. I think that the um, dev tooling is a massive unlock. And I think to add to that, at least for my journey, um, I've been following Bitcoin for a long time, but it really wasn't until I started building Trident and I was hands-on keyboard building out an actual end-to-end -end Bitcoin wallet and using Bitcoin Dev Kit. So Bitcoin Dev Kit and Lightning Dev Kit are massive, massive force multipliers. Huge. And being able to, as, like, as Randall said, layer one Bitcoin, even if you've read all of the BIPs and you've been to maybe a couple dozen bit devs, and, but you haven't actually hands-on keyboard type this stuff out, it is very abstract until you, like the network is very opinionated. Valid transaction, not valid transaction. So the moment you start trying to do anything, you get a really quick smack on the wrist of like, no, that is not right, right? And like actually getting your hands dirty. And what's great is that you can actually start, um, in reducing the barrier into entering the Bitcoin development space using tools like BDK and LDK, because you're not starting with, okay, let me, you know, do finite elliptic curve cryptography, right? Like, like, I don't have to worry about that. Those things I can take out of the box and start trying to like, at a higher level of abstraction, start messing and coding around with stuff. And then you get really deep into building PSBTs, right? And broadcasting transactions and, you know, constructing, you know, custom output descriptors, like all of those things start clicking into place. I think that's a really critical piece um, for really kind of advancing the conversation. It, it's just whatever level of competency you're at, just try and go one step beyond that and just start trying to expand your like perception of it. Well, I mean, it's very hard for anybody to come into the space and try to do anything without trying to do something, right? <laughs> I mean, that's true for any space. Like, you know, it, yeah. it, if you're just going to like download uh, wallet.js and stick it in your app, right? Like, you know... It, it's going to be hard for you to survive this space without money gone. <laughs> so, and also at the same time, I mean, realistically speaking, you know, with the complexity that Bitcoin is nowadays, it's nearly impossible for somebody to just come out of nowhere and build and maintain a wallet from scratch, you know, and like, and have that like, you know, really like bug free enough that people are not losing money using it while he's still building, I don't know, some other business logic around it. Right. I mean, it's a ginormous effort. Uh, it seems simple once you build your single, see, the first time you serialize a transaction, just a simple thing, a simple legacy, maybe transaction, right. You make it, you send it fine. But now like start playing with the edge cases, start like it, it becomes like insanity. Right. So, you know, things like BDK, uh, old days, they used to be PyCoin, uh, and, and there's quite a few, these projects, right? Like, 
uh, I think we're sort of finally arriving at a point where people are not building wallets. They're sort of like contributing back to a wallet that's in a language that they like. And, uh, and, and, and hopefully we get like more knowledge sharing around the, you know, more complicated things, the edge cases, uh, you know, all that kinds of interesting scripting and, you know, how to create comms. Yeah, I mean, you know, for, for if, if you're a new dev to the space, uh, do check out uh, Jimmy Song's uh, course. He has essentially like a course where you go and uh, you build a wallet from scratch. That's the course. Uh, and uh, highly, highly recommend it, even if you're a seasoned developer. Bitcoin is not just a simple thing. <laughs> yeah, his, his book is really good, too. Yes. And I mean, to, to, you know, these more complex things. Programming Bitcoin, right? Yep. Yeah, Programming Bitcoin. Uh, really good book. Um, you know, when Alex announced this project, I joined the Telegram group. And like the thing that I wanted selfishly is um, I'm, I'm doing some stuff with like adapter signatures and kind of scriptless scripts right now. And like, I want to find more people who are interested in that, right? So regardless of what the application is, like there's not a ton out there. You, you kind of have to like just go and stare at old Andrew Polstra slides over and over again until it starts to make sense. Um so just, you know, having some some space where people can kind of find each other that are working on these more advanced uh, like script constructions, I think will be really helpful. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I really think like the space is growing, right? Like, it, I guess like another reality is part of growing pains is that we have more people now in it, right? There's more projects now in it. And the more people you have in something, like the harder it is to have communication, you know, like work well. So, you know, we also didn't have Optech way back then. We also didn't have, like, any resemblance to a reasonable conversation back then, uh, you know. Uh, you either knew some people you talked to in private or you didn't, or you were willing to go on uh, Bitcoin Wizards on IRC. You know, most people would go on IRC with a different name <laughs> to ask stupid questions. Highly recommended, by the way. If you have a question you're embarrassed of asking, just use a different name and ask on IRC. So, anyways, I mean, like, I, I feel, I feel like what what Alex is doing is very cool because, like, I think it's like the next sort of like obvious step that we need in terms of like uh, coordination, in terms of, of communication. You know, ideas need to be sold, right? So, um, you know, having having competitive analysis charts. And uh, compatibility charts uh, help people understand like where things realistically unbiasedly stand. You know, I think once you put simplicity there with you know eighty five thousand lines of diff, and you know, it starts to look like okay, well maybe we should look at something else, right? Maybe we shouldn't wait ten years for us to have cold for OptiX, or you know, it's just like this very obvious things that come when you're trying to be more pragmatic. You know, I, I had about the whole competitive analysis thing but it was amazing how effective mm -hmm. that stoplight chart that barack did That's for uh for for arc was like the number of people on twitter that were like i i don't know what a vtxo is but i saw the chart now it what it green for art <laughs> i like art no marketing and, like, works as, as man as about, yeah as much as people talk about like Oh, Bitcoiners like don't trust. They always verify, and they're very skeptical of people. <laughs> the number of people that were hyped on Arc because there were more green columns was hilarious, and it was only like four rows or three rows or something, right? Like it wasn't even like anything long. Yeah, one of them was like was like does it <laughs> Good. scale green, green. right? Like, scale yeah. green. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Great yeah. green. Like, That's there, it. there should have been a fifth row for like how many seed oils were in each one. <laughs> That's what I said Arc like, <laughs> seed oils and. Lightning lock seed oils. It would have been winner. I, I mean, it just briefly says that um, the audience that you're often trying to sell to at Twitter are not technically capable to vet the claims themselves. They're looking for a high level, pretty picture of things, right? They're not going to be going into the stack. But you know, but that's that's true for everything, right? We all need a, a oracle above, right? Like, sure, you know, like realistically speaking, like you know, there's how many people in the world can like review libsec? Like, I mean, seriously. Like actually review that thing, right? I mean, maybe ten people. <laughs> you know, like that—that—that's just how it works, right? I mean, but but the cool thing is, like, 
the oracles don't mean that you're just taking a face value either, right? I mean, you still need industry validation. You have market validation, right? Like these things are all like important heuristics, right? And I, I think like Bitcoin is always going to be this game of heuristics, like because it's a soup. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I'm I'm sort of like living proof of that because like the Oracle game is also sometimes something that you refine over time. And, you know, I'm not the most technical person. I LARP uh, as a technical person, but, I, you know, I can't write code to save my life. But I was very lucky early on to to get a bit of an Oracle in, in Greg Maxwell that was kind of like able to align me with the right foundation, uh, the right heuristics, as you say, of like what is good and what is bad. And I've sort of just evolved that over time into an intuition for like what are the the projects that like at face value uh, appear cool, but uh, you know there's some kind of hidden or some kind of like twist to them that make them not necessarily incentive compatible or whatever that is. Uh, and there's a lot of value for in in people, you know, to some extent, no being able to identify which oracles they should they should choose because right now they're getting bombarded with noise all over the place and a lot of the stuff they'll never be able to verify themselves but if you abstract it abstract it a, a little bit to a higher level there's a lot of like you can sort of like bend uh people in the right direction i think and um you know one of the cool thing like you, you talk about barack's art presentation but something else that i found was really fascinating and super productive was the uh uh, the pay join, um, which is another project, actually, you, you were asking earlier about like a tangible, uh, non software required uh, project that I think is going to sort of like start catching on a little bit more. And, and with the pay join dev kit, uh, I think this is something else that is going to be hugely beneficial, does not need change. And if they're able to put together the, the serverless component to it, um, is going to, to see yeah, a lot of traction. But the cool, the really cool thing that they did is they worked with the Bitcoin design community to put together a, uh, a case study uh, that is, you know, um, easily consumable by, you know, not overly technical people. Certainly, you need some technical inclination to be interested in, in, in this. But if you look at that, if, and if you never understood PageOne in the first place, you can read through that document and come out of it much more uh, enlightened about like what this technology means, even if you don't, you know, grok all of the fine details of it. They even go as far as creating mockups of UX flows. How would user be interacting with PayJoin in a wallet? And that's hugely beneficial to sort of like rally people, you know, the plebs that don't necessarily are not going to go and verify the implementation at the code level. Um, but if you generate if you generate excitement uh, from these people, that it can be, create a positive outcome in terms of you know momentum, and it it can also so like remove like one of the things that you want to do is like you want to better inform people because you want to remove that drag that they sometimes create because because of their like you know the all the ossification conversation. People are uncertain. People don't understand things and. So if they if when they don't start understanding things, they just start rejecting anything that comes their way, even if it's beneficial for them. Well, I mean, it's a lot of responsibility, right? Because you know everybody got bamboozled into four megabyte blocks, for example, right? Because you know, like the devs got tired of like being the punching bag uh, from both sides, right? So then instead of like, oh, no, we're going to do this weight thing and sort of like, you know, and, you know, and it got very sort of unless you could maybe even read this and a lot of confusion happened, right? You could almost say almost on purpose. Uh, and, you know, we, we got four megabyte blocks. So I think when we do distill the stuff and especially involve the designers and the people who are going to be sold ideas by other people, you know, the responsibility there is ginormous for them to understand what they're selling. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully it works out well. Or even like a more recent example, there was a ton, of, we were talking about this earlier, there was a ton of confusion about what Tapper was and wasn't and is and isn't. Like, I think we all probably remember, you know, breathless, blog posts and articles about how 
you know, Taproot was going to bring, I'm doing air quotes right now for people. Smart contracts. Smart contracts. <laughs> Bitcoin and how Bitcoin was going to like become Ethereum because of Taproot, which wasn't true. There were some more nuanced people who thought that CISA, like cross input signature aggregation was part of Taproot, which it wasn't. Um, and there's a lot of cool things that you can do in Taproot that people don't understand that you can. And, you know, the way that you build applications and like structure things in Taproot is very different from what you can do pre-Taproot. And, and I think a lot of that just hasn't been and still isn't well understood. Cool, guys. I mean, listen, uh, I, I think we sort of like covered, you know, like a, a decent bit about this. I really want to see where, where Alex goes. I think it's a pretty cool project. I think we need it. I think we need more docs. We need more conversation. We need more SWOT analysis, and we need more green checkboxes. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Rindel. I'm not even going to mention the name. It's like it's like it's like uh, Vladimir Va- Va- Valdemar? No, Valdemar. 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 So, guys, any final thoughts, Rindel? Go. Looking forward to following the project. If you haven't seen it, Alex has a Telegram group where people are talking about cool Bitcoin script things. So definitely check it out. Rob. Yeah, check out the Telegram group. Definitely. um, It's been fun to just kind of sit there and watch all the discussion going on, helping me keep sharp. An interesting thing, just at a high level, thinking about Bitcoin script that would be on like my wish list beyond like some sort of vault, op vault like structure would be conditional things based on the amount of money you're trying to spend. And I know T love in combination with an additional op code could in theory do that. Right now, Bitcoin script just is a binary check of do you pass the logic you asked for or do you fail the logic, right? And it would be really interesting. And I'm thinking like, there's not even proposals that could do this right now, but there's no reason why we couldn't start talking about this of where if you're trying to spend 10 Bitcoin, you have this kind of security branch. But if you're trying to spend, you know, 5,000 sats, you have this branch, right? And that, the idea that UTXO could be aware of what it's trying to spend against would be really interesting. I only learned about uh, that T love in combination with some other stuff could do this because of Shinobi over the weekend. I went to Bitcoin Optech and just started reading through. So a huge shout out to Bitcoin Optech. If there's anything like there's a couple of codes we've been talking about that go into much deeper detail in their topic section, I would definitely give them a shout out if you're trying to find somewhere between random Twitter discussions and podcasts like this and like, you know, the mailing list. They do a really great job kind of pushing out the, the more technical and the weeds discussions as well. Yeah, it's it's quite fantastic. I mean, props props to those guys. Alex, final thoughts, sir. Yeah, I'll, I'm gonna echo that as well. Um, I, you know, BDK, LDK, Optech were were a huge inspiration for for what I'm trying to do. But um, you know, um, as a final thought, like I think I just want to make this um, this whole thing building thing a little more fun and you were also a good inspiration for me uh, for bitcoin review i know like you like to say that like people are sleeping throughout your podcasts but really, <laughs> like, true. I, I feel i feel like i feel like <laughs> i feel like it's a good um i i, I feel uh, that it's good banter always um it's it humanizes you know the people and the builders that are working in this space and that's also some some of the stuff that I'm trying to do uh, by by getting through to those people and actually, you know, picking up a piece of technology and highlighting how this person is um, is is building on it and what are the cool stuff that they're doing with it. So I'm just looking forward to to meet with more people and, and get other people's input on on the project, but on Bitcoin as a whole and exchange on uh, this ecosystem. And uh, hopefully I have some more uh, meat to that bone down the line in a couple of months, perhaps. And, and we can truly sort of like build off that moment, that, that momentum going into the halving. It'd be pretty cool if, you know, th- there's a resurgence already of, of a Bitcoin building and it's extremely exciting. And I think that's, this is probably the one thing that makes me the most bullish right now. Yeah. And then there is the discussion about how to activate things, which is a whole other nightmare. But um, no, this is this is awesome. I'm really looking forward to it. Like uh, Rindell, Rob, thank you so much for coming on. I really, really appreciate. Y- you guys are awesome. And uh, Alex, I, I can't, I can't wait to see it, sir. I, you know, is it is it ready yet? Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. 
Thanks for listening. For more resources, check the show notes. We put a lot of effort into them. And remember, we don't have a crystal ball. So let us know about your project. Visit bitcoin.review to find out how to get in touch. Mm-hmm.